Crosspoint Church was looking for a pastor who would only care for you and keep you happy, keep the sheep in the pen and keep them well fed, you got the wrong pastor. When God called Don Porter to this church, he called somebody who's passionate about worshiping and glorifying God. And I know Don and Beth's heart, they're passionate about helping Christians grow deep in their faith, deep discipleship. But these two people are relentless about the call of the church of Jesus Christ under the, the words of the risen Lord Jesus Christ to go make disciples of all nations. And so if you're looking for somebody, a pastor, if you're trying to find a pastor that would just care about you, you got the wrong guy. But you got a pastor who cares about the church as deeply as any pastor I know. But Don and Beth have a heart for the world. And i got to tell you, just the, the last 24 hours being here and meeting this congregation, um, God is, is doing and will continue to do a work through this church to shine the light of his gospel through this community if you're willing to follow and have the courage to go where God calls you to go. And that's going to be my prayer for you. And, and today I, I get the chance to share a message that I, I preached this message three, four weeks ago in Tasmania. Uh, I preached it before it, that in Melbourne, Australia. I've been able to preach this message a lot of places because this is the passion uh, of the heart of Jesus. And if the heart of Jesus is in your heart, it will be your passion too. Now, my, my journey began, I actually grew up in Huntington Beach, California, not too far from where, from where I met Don, and I grew up in an area where, I grew up along the coast, so if you, if you kind of got to PCH, you got to Pacific Coast Highway, looked towards the water, you saw sand, and you saw ocean. But if you turned around and looked the other way, pretty much pavement from there to the San Bernardino Mountains. Where I grew up, in, particularly in that area, it's just like little town after town after town after town, and there weren't many things left that were, that were kind of growing there. Natural things were torn down, strip malls, houses, just developed all the way up. So I grew up in a, in, in a little town, but I didn't feel any civic pride. I didn't feel, I didn't really, our town didn't have a lot of things that we, you know, we didn't talk about being from our little town. And, and it was a little town called Fountain Valley, and it's just, just where I lived. But there was just towns all around it going from just kind of sprawling out. Then God called me, after growing up in that environment, to be a pastor in a little town called Byron Center, Michigan. I know the Porter girls are going to be able to smile at this because they're going to know the story as well. But So I ended up in a little town called Byron Center, Michigan. And it, the, the thing that was really exciting, Byron Center was so excited because they had a street light. Um, on, the corner, on the corner of 84th and Byron Center Avenue was their running street light. And that, it, was, it was quite exciting. And it was a small town. So when my three boys came running up to me one day, and they said, Dad, 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 can we go to the Byron Center Parade? There's this big parade in Byron Center. Can we go to the Byron Center? This is a teeny little town. And I'm not really a parade guy anyways. I lived in Pasadena for a number of years and went to the Rose Parade. And I would get bored with that after like the fifth band and the 18th float. I'm just, I'm, I get distracted easily. So I'm like, I'm not a parade guy. But my three little boys come in there and say, Dad, Dad, can we go to the Byron Center Parade? And I'm thinking, what's going to be in the parade? Like, you know, tractors, flatbeds with the junior high, seventh, you know, seventh grade girls volleyball team, and, you know, a couple convertibles. Yes, it's exactly what it was. And maybe a fire truck. Woo! Um, and so I'm kind of like, I don't want to go to the Byron Center Parade. But when parents, grandparents, th this is my three little boys at that time. This is a picture of them. When little faces like that come up to you and they say, Daddy, can we go to the Byron Center Parade? Parents, grandparents, what do you say? You say, I love parades. You, you, know. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, we tell the truth, but sometimes we, you know, we love our kids too. And so, so, so I find myself sitting right around the corner of Byron Center Avenue and 84th Street. And I've been thinking, I, I, I said to my boys before, I said, well, who goes to this parade? And they said, everybody. And I get there and I'm sitting there and I'm looking up and down the street and it's like four, five, six people deep. It's like, they, it's like they bust people in from Wayland and Door and Moline, all these other small towns. They've all come for the parade. Now, I've already looked in the parking lot of the high school, and I've seen what's going to be coming down the parade route, and it's not impressive. Um, it's just, you know, the, the kids could actually put, like, you know, they could decorate their bikes and ride in the parade. It was just, it was just a small town parade. And then, all the parents are sitting here, but the kids are a couple a little bit forward of them, and the kids can't sit still. They're, they're like Labradors wagging their tail and moving around like Don Porter is most of the time. They're like, they're like, oh, they're so excited, and the kids, they can't sit still. And, I, and I'm thinking, why are all these people here? Why are these kids excited? What's going on? And I've got no idea. I have no idea what's coming. I don't know why they're there, why they're excited. Until the parade starts. 
And in about two or three minutes, as they're starting to come down the road there, I realized why the kids are so excited. And the answer, the answer to that question is in one word. If you grew up in a small town, if you know what I'm talking about, in one word, does anybody know why the kids were so excited? Anybody? Yeah. See? You knew that. Some of you know this. I had no idea. <laughs> On every flatbed, in every truck, in every convertible, there's kids. And they all have baskets of candy. And this stuff... And thank you, Don Porter. This is not the cheap candy. This is the good stuff. And they all had baskets and buckets and bags of candy. And these kids had one job. What is that? Throw the candy, right? So the parade starts. And I realize, oh, God, their kids are excited about the candy. So as the parade begins, I'm watching. And, I, and I'm always studying people. I love, I love learning from people, studying people. So I'm watching these kids. And I discover there's two kinds of kids when it comes to throwing candy in a parade. All right, first, first, there's this kid. There's this kid. They're on the back of the flat, but they're looking out, and, and they're, they're going along like this. They're going along. <laughs> you know, all the kids are going, throw us candy! And, and they're just like, they're, they're, they're like waiting for the wind conditions, and they're trying to find someone they know. Then they see someone they know, and they, they look in their bucket, and they're thinking, they're almost, and, they, and they, they finally got one little candy, and they're like, and then they're, and they don't, you know, and then they keep going. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, she, you looked really excited. You like m ms with peanuts, don't you? Well, no. Okay, so, so, and so they're going down the parade route, and then finally, finally, you realize they see somebody that they recognize, and, they, and, they're, and the wind conditions are right, and, and the stars are aligned, and they pick the right candy, and they finally look at the person. I, praise the Lord. You're charismatic, so if you're raising your hands, praise Jesus. Good. Um, and they finally see the person, and they look, and they throw it out there. And, and I'm watching this, and here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, these kids that won't throw any candy, they must be thinking, when the parade's over, maybe, you know, maybe I get to keep my bucket of candy. Or something, I don't know. They're just not throwing candy. And then, on every flatbed, in, but in every truck, in every convertible, there's kids that they, they turn out of the corner of the parking lot and they just start throwing candy. And they can't, you were so excited before. You, and they just can't control themselves. So they're throwing candy everywhere. And they're just, what would the kids be doing in the parade? And they just, and everyone they saw that they knew and they didn't, and somebody in the balcony are going, we should have sat in the front. And they, it's for after church and share evenly among the family. Oh! And they're throwing candy everywhere. Oh, yeah, I praise the Lord. And, they, and these kids cannot control themselves. And so what I realized is there's some kids in that parade that it's almost like, like they thought, well, I could just throw. They're going to get like 20 yards on the parade or they're going to be out of candy because they just can't control themselves. And I got to tell you, as I'm sitting there on the curb of Byron Center Avenue watching this unfold, and watching these kids, I just had this, this kind of this revelation, this moment where God spoke to me. Have you ever had it where there's a passage in the Bible you've read many times, you heard it in Sunday school, you've read it many times, and all of a sudden it's like the Holy Spirit just kind of pulls the veil back and you go, oh, I see this passage in a whole, I mean, I, I, I learned from it before, it's God's word, it had taught me, but all of a sudden there's this new vista, this new view, this view, new vision that comes from the word of God and the spirit of God speaks to your heart. That happened to me sitting on the curb of Byron Center Avenue watching this small town parade. And this is the passage from the Bible that came to my heart. This is the passage that all of a sudden I had new insight to. So as you listen to God's word from Luke chapter 8, as you listen today, try to think, why, why did this passage come to my heart and my mind sitting there on that curb during that parade? What was it that struck me? This is Luke chapter 8 beginning in verse 4. This is God's word. While a large crowd was gathering... And people were coming to Jesus from town after town. He told them this parable. He told them this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good 
soil. And it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, Jesus called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Oh God, this is our prayer today. Let our ears hear what you have to say to us. Speak to us about being those who are scattered so we can scatter. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, that that moment, that experience was eye-opening for me. It was transformational for me. Because I discovered that there's different kinds of people. And this, this story from the Bible uh, came alive to me because I, I, I knew enough about the culture of the first century to know that when Jesus told this story, his listeners would have been confused about this kind of a farmer. Because farmers in the ancient world, there were no farm subsidies. There was not like high value of property that you could sell and make money. Farmers in those days were living day by day and crop by crop. And if they didn't have a crop, they would not only probably starve, their family would starve. It was serious business. So farmers planted seed prayerfully and carefully. Most farmers were not throwing seed on the road. And, and, if you're, and I, live in this, I live in the Salinas Valley, one of the richest farm areas in the world, and I have lots of farmers in my church, and they would tell you, man, they now plant at a certain time, in certain moisture, certain depths with machines that plant a certain distance. I mean, it's, it's a science, man. They don't, they don't want to waste a single seed. They're still careful about the cost of seeds. But this farmer... This sower of seed, there's a road, throw some seed. It's weedy, throw some seed. It's hard packed, throw some seed. Soil looks good, throw some seed. They just, this this farmer just was, was reckless. This farmer was like those kids in that parade who were just throwing candy like there was no end to how much candy they could throw. And as I sat there on that curb, I, I was just I was just overwhelmed with that picture. That that's what God wants from his children. We have one lifetime, and we're on this little parade of life. And the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ is better than the best candy and the best treat and the best thing you can imagine. And when we scatter the seed, here's the beauty. The bucket never runs empty. I actually think the more we scatter the seed, the more we realize how much there is. So that everywhere we go, we can scatter the seed. That's the heart of Jesus for us. And these people in the ancient world would have heard this story and seen that this farmer was a seed-throwing machine. He was reckless, bold, relentless. This, this sower of seed just threw seed and threw seed and threw seed and didn't seem to care about where it landed. The, the, the farmer just scattered seed. Now, in the ancient world, this is a farmer scattering seed, but Jesus' stories had spiritual meaning. He was trying to teach us something, teach them something and teach us. If the seed is the word of God and the goodness of the gospel, the message of Jesus, and we are the sowers. Jesus is painting a picture for us, a picture I never fully got until that moment on, on the, uh, sitting on that curb and watching some kids hold on to what they had as if it was their own, and other kids scattering freely. And I thought, that's the picture that God wants us to have. So here's my question for you. And sometimes pastors ask questions, and they aren't really asking for an answer. The first two questions I ask, I actually want an answer, all right? So here, here's my first question for you. If this, if this parable is about us and about the gospel, the word of God being scattered around the world, and you take this parable seriously, here's the first question. Where should we throw the seed of God's love and God's grace and the message of Jesus? Where is the right place to scatter the seed? What's the answer? Everywhere. Everywhere we go. Now, we're kind of like, oh, that, that, not there, that's not a good place. Oh, they wouldn't understand, they wouldn't, you know. Okay, well, maybe, you know, we, we, we travel along, you know, like we have one seed to throw, and we're waiting for the perfect moment. But I, I think what Jesus is trying to say is, everywhere. And, and then here's the second question, and, and, and you could probably guess what the second question is. And that is, when should we throw the seed of God's love and God's grace and the message of Jesus? When's the right time to scatter the seed? What's the answer? All the time. That, that's that's the right time to be scattered and to scatter the seed of the gospel. This is the heart of Jesus. Now, here's my third question. This is one I want you to not respond to out loud, but I want you to ponder for a minute. And I want you to really think about this. Why should we throw the seed of God's love, grace, and good news even when the soil might not look receptive? Why would we scatter this good, precious, good news of the gospel 
Why would we take it and just scatter it freely in an environment that looks like hard soil or weedy soil or a path? Why would we do that? And, and I want to share something with you. I, I believe that this is the truth of, of what God wants us to hear, but it's kind of hard to hear. And, and I'm actually going to say something that, might, that may, be, may come across as a little bit insulting, but that's okay. I'm a pastor, and that's my job. Um, as, a young, as a young pastor in training, I had this older pastor say to me, and I thought this was beautiful. He said, he said, you know, pastors exist to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Isn't that good? To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So if you're feeling comfortable and you're maybe not scattering seed the way you should, that, that, that you should be afflicted, you should be challenged. So, so do something for me. When I count to three, we just say out loud with whole hearts, afflict us, pastor. Let's just try that. One, two, three. Well, since you asked. Um, <clears throat> here, here's, why, here's why we scatter the seed of the gospel even when the soil doesn't look receptive. Here's why. Because we're not smart enough to know if somebody's heart is ready. This pastor visits us and he tells us we're not smart. No, I didn't say you're not smart. You're probably brilliant. But I'll tell you what you're not smart enough to do. You cannot look at another human being and know for certain if their heart is ready. So what we do, our call, is to scatter. It's God's call to take care of it from there. We believe in a sovereign God who's on the throne. But we believe he's called us to scatter the seed. And, 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 and I praise God with all my heart for people who came into my life and started to scatter the seed of the gospel when I did not look ready. I was almost 16 years old. I grew up in a home with no faith, no Jesus. Um, I heard the name of God, the name of Jesus, when my dad was angry, and I, it wasn't praise the Lord. And I, I grew up in an environment where I didn't know Christmas and Easter were religious holidays. I had no spiritual point of reference at all. But my sister Gretchen, five kids in our family, my dad and my mom, and my sister Gretchen, one year older than me, she had gone to this church that loved people where they were at and shared the love of Jesus, and she had come to faith in Jesus Christ. She had come to the cross, confessed her sins, received Jesus, taken his hand. She was walking with Jesus. So you know what my sister started to do? She started to scatter seed in my life. Now, you have to know my sister Gretchen. Potentially the most shy person I've ever met. Gretchen is painfully shy. If she's around two or three people, she won't say much. If she's in a group of five or six, she'll never say a word. To this day, even in our, you know, she, with one person, she's articulate, she's brilliant. Uh, she she was, uh, worked in HR for the Irvine company for years. I mean, she, she's just a gifted person, but just interpersonally, very, very, very quiet. And yet, in her quietness, in her shyness, when she became a Christian, she, she, just, she just started to, in her own gentle way, just kind of scatter some seed toward me. She started to love me and care about me in a way she never had before, which drove me crazy because up to that point we fought, balance of power, we knew how it worked. She didn't like me, I didn't like her, we fought. It was, it was perfect. Um, I mean, just, it, and, and, now, and now she wouldn't fight with me. She was nice to me. She was just scattering seeds of kindness. And then she was, she was playing this new Christian rock music, Benny Hester Band and Sweet Comfort Band, and Larry Norman. Some of you guys go, well, it takes me back, you know. Uh, but she's, she's playing this music, and she'd say, you know, do you want to hear this? It's really great music. She's trying to kind of witness through her music. And then she even dared to open her mouth and share with me about how she knew and loved Jesus and how his forgiveness had changed her life. And she shared her story. And she shared his story, God's story, the story of Jesus. And I was merciless, and I was mean, and I was nasty, and she just kept tossing the seeds into my life. And my heart, it, it, you have to understand, at, this, at that point in my life, I'm almost 16 years old, my grade point average in school that year was a 0.75. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be a math genius to figure that one out. Um, I, my, I had hair down to here. I was a surf punk. I, if there was good waves, I wasn't at school. My parents couldn't control me. I cared about nothing and no one but myself. I was a totally self-absorbed punk. And I did not look like good soil. And my sister scattered seed in my direction. And then she introduced me to a friend of hers named Doug. This really old, he's an old guy. He was 19. And... Um, <laughs> He had started in college, and he had a Volkswagen Beetle, just a cool guy. And Doug had just recently met Jesus, and he had fallen in love with Jesus. And this guy, Doug, comes to me. I got to know him through my sister. And this guy, Doug, comes to me. He says, hey, listen, if you, I know you don't have a car. You know, I didn't quite have a license yet. He said, if you ever need a ride anywhere, just call me, and I'll come pick you up 
and take you there. And I'll pick you back afterwards and bring you home. If I'm available, I'll just, it's like Uber, but not even paying. And, uh, and so uh, I started calling this guy. And anytime I got through to him, and there weren't cell phones in those days, they, they, for the kids, the phones were actually t- attached with a wire to the wall. <laughs> Ask your grandparents about it. Um, but, but, you know, I, when, he, when I'd get a hold of him, he'd, he'd drive down and pick, he'd drive like 15 minutes, he'd pick me up, he'd drive me, usually to my girlfriend's house, and then I'd hang out with her, I'd call him, he'd drive, me, drive over drive me back home again. And when we were in the car, he talked about the three things he loved. He talked, about, uh, he talked about his girlfriend he was dating uh, named Lisa. His name was Doug Drainville. He was dating this girl, Lisa. So he talked about his girlfriend. He talked about his family. He loved his family. And he lost his brother recently in, in, in a car accident. And he talked about his brother. And he talked about Jesus, this new closest friend he had who was carrying him through some family losses and some pain in his life. And he, and he, but I, I was in the Volkswagen. It's a small little car. I'm in the front seat there. And I'm trapped. And he's just talking about life. But Jesus, and, he, and, and this guy, Doug, he just... As he served, as he shared, he just scattered seed into my heart. And I didn't look ready. And I wasn't receptive. I was so hard-hearted. I'm going to be honest with you. I look back, I think back, I don't know if I ever said thank you to him for those rides. And I know I never gave him a dime for gas. And he kept showing up. And he kept loving and serving and sharing. And then finally my sister talked me into going to her youth group at her church. And she had tried many times. I was hostile. I had actually, one time she was trying to do the Jesus thing with me. I threw her Bible on the ground. I stomped on her Bible. I said, I want nothing to do with this. I was so hot. I did not look like good soil. You getting the point? But people kept scattering. And she said to me, I want to invite you to come to something. Don't say, don't say no till I tell you what it is. I said, okay, fine. What is it? She says, well, at my church, at my youth group, there's going to be about a thousand high school kids coming. And they're having a casino night with 21 tables, roulette wheels, and a 20-girl can-can dancing line. This is a long time ago. And so, <laughs> and, and, I, and for the first time, church sounded interesting. And so I went to church for the first time to this youth group. And in a room probably the size of this room, it was all true, all that she had said. And at the end of the evening, they had everyone sit down on the floor, and the youth pastor, a guy named Dan Webster, got up. And he gave a message, and I remember the message. It was this, life's a gamble, where are you putting your chips? And he talked about taking a risk and giving your life to Jesus. I didn't become a Christian that day, but I did through that ministry and through those people a few months later. But here's the point. If Gretchen, my sister, or Doug, my friend, or Dan, the youth pastor, looked at me and said, I'm only throwing seeds in a place that looks like good soil, nobody would have thrown a single seed in my direction. But can I tell you what? At almost 16 years old, with a pretty much a self-centered, hate-filled, outward exterior. Somehow, by a mystery of the sovereignty of God, my heart was ready, and the soil was ready. And in a matter of a couple of months, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I've never been the same. The day I said yes to Jesus, he called me to full-time ministry. I, m- I remember telling the youth pastor that the, the evening of this, this youth outing, I prayed to receive Jesus. Before I went to bed that night, I prayed, and I said, God, what do I do now? And I, and I just felt like God said, spend the rest of your life telling people about Jesus or you'll be miserable. And I didn't know about you at 16, but I knew I didn't want to be miserable. So I said, okay. And the next morning I said to the youth leader, I said, what do I have to do to become a pastor? He said, he, this is what he said. He said, dude, you've been a Christian like seven hours. <laughs> and I said, what do I got to be a pastor? And he said, get a haircut. <laughs> I, said, I said, really? He goes, no. He said, I'm jo-. he said, I'm joking. I'm joking. He says, but you know what he did? He said, but you should. So he gave me my first Bible. He said, this is the word of God. You're supposed to read it. You're supposed to know it. So I started to devour the scriptures. When I got home, I told my parents, my non-believing parents, that I was going to be a pastor. And my dad said, you'll get over it. And I said, no, dad, I'm going to be a pastor. He said, there's no money in it. And I said, that's not why you become a pastor. And then I got my Bible. I started reading my Bible. And, 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 and that, but, but here's what I want to say to you. We travel through our days, so many of us, waiting for the perfect person and the perfect moment and the perfect situation and the right wind temperatures to know if it's the right time to throw one seed to somebody. But God calls us to be scattered around the world in our community and to scatter the gospel everywhere we go to everybody we meet. And so I want to just share a couple of things as as we're drawing near the end of our time. And and I'm looking at the time I've got till 10.32. I'm being really good. I got till 11.30. Thank you. Okay. Um, (laughs) Okay. Okay, thank you. I want, I want to honor, I, I try, really try to honor the time on things, but I want to, I want to challenge you 
For many of you, and I met with some of your leaders last night, and they were even talking about the fact for some people, sharing faith comes really naturally. That's about 3% of Christians. 3% of Christians are gifted as evangelists. That it's sharing their faith comes naturally, which means, do the math, what percentage of Christians is it, is it challenging for? About 97%, right? It's challenging for 97% of Christians to share their faith. But when Jesus called us to follow him, this is what Jesus said. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, my person, my follower, you must, they must deny themselves, take up their cross every day, be willing to die every day, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. When Jesus says every day, deny yourself, be willing to be crucified in the most brutal way possible, and die, and follow me, does that sound easy? What's the answer? No! So when people say, what well, makes me uncomfortable to share my faith? It's like, hey, great, then you're a Christian. Say, so, no, but, but it, make, it makes me nervous. Great, then be nervous, get on your knees, seek the face of Jesus, and scatter the seeds. So you say, how do we scatter? I'll share a couple thoughts, and then I know that Pastor Don and his team here are going to be teaching you and equipping you through all your ministries how to scatter the seeds. But here's a few of the ways that we live into this. How can you as individuals and as a congregation here at Cross Point Church scatter the seed of the gospel with greater passion and greater freedom? Here's the first thing. Love people as Jesus does. At the end of the day, what my sister Gretchen did and what Doug did is they just loved me when I was unlovable. You can do that. You can love people who are different than you. You can love people who you disagree with. I love that the, 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 the scripture says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we were cleaned up because guess what? We couldn't clean ourselves up. So while other people are still sinners, we serve them. We love them. You can do that. Love people wherever they are. Second, Pray for and with people when God opens the door. Pray for people that you love and care about that don't know Jesus. Family members, friends, people at your school, people in your workplace, people in social studies, people in your neighborhood, people in your retirement center. Pray faithfully. Pray daily. Pray passionately because prayer makes a difference. And can I challenge you? When you're talking with a non-believer and they share an incredible pain in their life and a deep sorrow, well, the next time you're with a non-Christian and they share a deep sorrow, will you look at them and say, listen, I don't know if you feel comfortable with this, and, and if you don't feel comfortable with you, that's fine. Tell me that. But I would be so honored if I could just take a minute and pray for you right now. I've done that thousands of times with non-believers. Three times I've had people say no. Thousands of times they've said yes, and every time the Holy Spirit sweeps into that moment. And you, you wouldn't believe how many non-believers, by the time I say amen, there are tears running down their face. They, they just say, I don't know why I'm crying. And I'll say, I know why. God's Holy Spirit is here coming upon you right now. And then we can have a conversation about faith and about Jesus. You pray for people and pray with people and watch what God does. Here's the third thing. Engage freely and often in spiritual conversations. Have spiritual conversations with people that don't know Jesus. We'll talk about our car, we'll talk about our favorite sports team, we'll talk about hair products, we'll talk about restaurants. Why not talk about Jesus? I had one of your leaders in the church, I had Jim give me this bracelet today. And it says, God's got it. If you don't have one of these and you see Jim, he'll make you put one on. And so, no, no he, he, didn't, he, gave it, he gave it to me graciously, I put it on. But um, I put this on after Jim gave it to me because I'm going to be on a plane today, two planes today, flying to Michigan because I have a funeral for my brother-in-law that I'm going to conduct tomorrow. And, and so as I fly, I'm going to have this on my wrist. And if somebody around me or in the airport says, well, what's that mean? God's got it. What has he got? I'm going to tell him about my brother-in-law. I'm going to tell him about his life of faith. I'm going to tell him about his, his five years ago having a heart attack and a year ago getting cancer and that I'm burying him tomorrow with his family and with his wife and with his daughters. And I'm going to tell them that he knows Jesus. And he's with Jesus now. And then this little thing will be one of the things that will open the door for a conversation. But I don't need a wristband to do that. I can just be talking with people. And, and God's power, God's presence, it's worth talking about. So share your stories. You have stories of God's power, of God's presence, of God's comfort. One of my greatest testimonies I've ever anybody share was this woman, Kathy, who she said for like two years, the lady who did her hair would not let her talk about Jesus. She offered her a Bible. Every time she'd talk about Jesus, she said, I don't want to hear about it. And she tried to share, and this woman kept shutting the conversation down. But when Kathy's daughter had a relapse of cancer, and she went back to get her haircut, and the haircutting woman said, hey, how's your daughter Nikki doing? Kathy said, I just began to weep. 
She said, for the next hour, well, during my whole hair appointment, I just, I just talked about, I'm, just, it's, I'm heartbroken, I'm sorrowful, I didn't want to be back here again. But you know, my comfort has been God's word. And she began to talk about the Psalms that have ministered to her heart. And she said, my strength is God's people, the church, they've come around me and they care for me, they're bringing me meals, they're loving me. And my hope is in Jesus, my hope is in heaven. She said, I didn't even mean to be a witness. I didn't even mean, I just was so sad and I was just weeping and I was just telling her the only way I'm making it through is the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the prayers of God's people and the meals of God's people and the love of people. That's how I'm making it through. And at the end of this hour, she didn't even know she was giving a testimony. She was just sharing her heart and how God comforted her. At the end of the time, this woman who cut her hair said, said, Kathy, um, you've offered me a Bible a lot of times before and I've always said no. Is that, is that offer still open? Can you get me a Bible? What changed? Kathy just talked about her faith, her strength and her hope in Jesus in the most difficult of times of life. And so engage in spiritual conversations. You'll learn to do it more and more, and your team here will train you. And then finally, tell your story and tell his story. Tell your story and tell his story. Share the story of Jesus. Share your story, your encounter with Jesus. How he cha- I can't tell you how many times when, when, I, when people find out I'm a pastor and then I, I share it, tell them I grew up in an atheistic home. They'll say, how do you go from being an atheist to being a pastor? And I said, let me tell you. And I share my story. My wife grew up at Fourth Reform Church in Holland, Michigan, a good Christian church girl. Went to church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday nights, and she loved it. She became a Christian at five years old. But she has a testimony of how God has led her life and guided her life and fills her heart and carries her through the wonderful times and the hard times. You have a story to tell. And you have his story to tell. And it's the job of your leaders to teach you how to share your stories. They're committed to doing that. And infusing that because we exist to glorify God in worship, to grow believers in discipleship. We exist to bring the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And so I want to just invite you to reflect for a minute about how you live your life and about how you will live your life as you go forward. Will you be that little girl sitting on the flatbed in the parade and go through life with an ocean full of God's good news and God's grace? And will you go along like this, waiting, waiting, waiting for the perfect moment? Or will you commit yourself the minute you drive out of the parking lot anywhere, anytime in life, Here's your second row from the front. You ready? There you go. Uh, will you just, oh, you, and you just almost dove over there. Did I already throw them some? Okay, now I'm going over your head. Whoa. We got pa- we to we get some of you either praising Jesus or raising their hands for candy. But w- will, what kind of person will you be? What kind of person will you be? I heard a great little story years ago, and I'll close with this, and then I'll pray for you. I had a story with this husband and wife, and the wife was like, she could just, she was probably that 3% that could share her faith naturally. She could talk about, she'd be in the grocery store, standing in line, and she's talking about Jesus. Very natural for her. But the husband, man, it made him so nervous, and he, and he loved Jesus. He wanted to talk about his faith, but he said, every time I think about, just think about talking about my faith, my hands get all sweaty. I mean, my hands literally sweat, and my mouth gets dry as cotton. So his wife's saying to him, honey, you've got to share your faith more freely. And he said, but honey, every time I think about it, my hands sweat, and my, my mouth gets as dry as cotton. She said, I got an idea. She said, lick your hands, and then talk about Jesus. Right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this congregation. Lord, there's some here that, that they live this out. They do this as part of the flow of their life. Thank you, Lord. But, there, but most of the people here, Jesus, this is a challenge. This stretches them. I pray that your people will deny themselves and take up the cross and follow you, Jesus. Jesus, it costs you everything to bring us your good news. May we follow you even when it scares us and makes us nervous. And Lord, I thank you for bringing Pastor Don and Beth to this church and their family. I thank you for the mission that you sent this church on. And I thank you for the thousands of people throughout this community that are going to come to meet Jesus. Because these people are going to leave here and scatter the good news everywhere they go. Give us boldness, Lord, and use us to shine your light and scatter your seed. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Yeah.